An Undertaking by Noel Holt Published in the South Wales Daily Post on the 17th of October 1899 Read by Bethina The Undertaker proceeded cheerfully with his work. The rhythmic tap, tap, tap of his hammer was music to which his fancy fitted a pleasant tune. The picture of the even rows of brass heads shining brightly along the coffin lid under the rays of the shop lamp afforded him an artistic sense of satisfaction. And each fresh nail, as he fixed it in its place with a nicety coming from long practice, added to the pleasurable feeling with which he surveyed his handiwork. The night was close and oppressive. The other shops in the street had been long shut and, the pavement being long deserted, the undertaker felt sufficiently free from observation to operate in his shirt sleeves and to keep the shop door open for what little fresh air might chance to enter. The job he was engaged on was booked for completion by the morning and partly because he found a professional enjoyment in the work perhaps and partly to save the payment of overtime, he had relieved his carpenter and was putting on the finishing touches himself. A little boy with a beer jug in his hand stopped at the open door and fixed a pair of half-fascinated eyes on the coffin until the undertaker, who did not like live boys, suddenly looked up with a grimace, whereupon he started off with a scared face and did not cease running until he reached the public house at the corner. The undertaker chuckled as the frightened footsteps died away on the pavement and resumed his tapping with quiet relish for some minutes when he was himself startled by a rather disturbing circumstance. This was the falling aslant the coffin lid of a heavy shadow. A man was standing by his side. The undertaker thought with a nervous shiver that he had not seen or heard the intruder enter the shop. "'You will no doubt think it a strange thing,' said the man, in a low and somewhat preoccupied tone. "'But as I was passing the window—' "'Thank goodness,' thought the undertaker. He did come in at the door then. "'I fancied I caught sight of a face in the coffin by your side, "'and was perturbed to distinguish in the features, as I thought, a likeness to my own. "'I took the liberty of stepping inside, and need not add that I at once realised my illusion. The coffin is quite empty. It was a queer notion, said the undertaker, involuntarily glancing at the coffin, which stood on a pair of trestles close by, as if to satisfy himself of the truth of the statement. I must have given you a turn. I shouldn't have liked it myself, I own, though we in the profession are not superstitious. Dead is dead, you know. Oh, as for that, put in the stranger quickly, I am quite at one with you and do not attach any importance to the incident. It was more curiosity, I assure you, that induced me to enter your shop. If you had any doubts, said the undertaker, you might set them at rest, for this coffin, and a beauty it is, though I say it, is bespoke. He tapped in another nail and added, quite a romantic affair, they tell me. I should like to hear, said the other. There's not much of it, but what there is sounds like a storybook. My carpenter knows something about the parties and told me the story. A young lady I had the pleasure of measuring three days since was to have been married a week or so ago when the husband that was to be was taken ill and instead of going to marry him, she went to nurse the young man. After a few days, the doctor gave him up and when it seemed that almost his last breath had come, she couldn't bear herself any longer, but said good-bye to him, went straight to her own bedroom, and died herself instead, though what took her off, unless so be it was the shock, nobody seems to know. And the last I have heard of the husband, that was to have been, is that he is recovering fast. The stranger listened with the languid air of one hearing a familiar recital. It is a rather long coffin, he said, eyeing it meditatively. The lady was tall, I suppose? 
She was, replied the undertaker, but I don't mind telling you, though it's, so to speak, against me professionally to say so, that it is longer by some two or three inches than it need have been. My man, who is of a sentimental turn and was thinking of the affair more than his business, set down the wrong measurements when I gave it to him, and the mistake was not found out until it was too late. Nobody will be much the wiser, that's one consolation. Come to look at you, I believe you would fit it better, sir, yourself, he added, chuckling. The stranger seemed to enter into the humour of the idea. Why, so I might he said with an answering laugh. It would not be surprising. Come now, let's see how far out you are. Where's your tape? He took off his hat, revealing a deep red scar across his forehead, the result of a wound so recent that it was hardly yet healed. You don't mean that, said the undertaker with an amazed expression. I do. Why not? There is no harm in it and no one to see. Come, my good friend, we are both of a humour, I see. So we are, <laughs> after the undertaker. You are the first live subject I've been asked to measure yet. Ha <laughs> ha, echoed the other, but you are sure of that? I have known people being buried alive. Such cases are perhaps more frequent than you think. Ugh, shuddered the undertaker. Don't suggest it, it's unprofessional. He had by this time taken the tape from his coat pocket and putting the end to the stranger's head let it drop to the floor. He could not help noticing as he did that the scar seemed to change colours like a chameleon from red to purple, then violet, deepening into black and back to crimson. He observed too that this was the only sign of colour on his visitor's countenance and it seemed by contrast to intensify the paleness of his features into a more than death-like pallor. A nasty cut, sir, he said curiously. How might you have come by it? The other, having resumed his preoccupied air, did not seem to hear, and the undertaker completed his measurement by stretching the tape to the interior length of the coffin. A fit, he exclaimed, a palpable fit. A new glove could not do it more neatly. The coffin might have been made on purpose for you. Yes, responded the stranger, in a tone that seemed to imply that he had known this to be the case all along. What are you lining it with? White satin, said the undertaker. Ah, yes, I like white satin, that will do. There will be no plate with names or anything of that sort, I hope. Initials only in the English character. Let the initials pass, then. No one will be the wiser. Anything else, sir? inquired the undertaker with the mock gravity of a tradesman taking his orders. Yes, you are clever at arranging these brass-headed nails, I see. I should like you to design in them at the foot here a heart, a broken heart, if you can represent it. But, dear me, said the stranger, with a little start, as if suddenly recollecting himself, what am I thinking of? Goodbye. You won't forget the heart. Leave that to me, responded the undertaker with a heavy laugh. He was never quite certain in thinking the matter over afterwards, whether or not he saw his mysterious visitor depart. But the next thing he was clearly conscious of was the presence of the carpenter, who hot and excited, rushed in and stood panting before his employer's astonished gaze. It's a rum pass, that is, he said when his breath was recovered. The rummiest pass I ever knew or heard of. I've been running all the way to tell you. You can stop that job. It's not wanted. She ain't dead. Not dead, cried the undertaker in amazement. No more dead than you or me. You've measured a life once for once. Coma or something of that sort, the doctors call it. She came round an hour or two ago, and there's a regular crowd outside the house already. But that's not all. Him she was to have married, who was getting well, grew suddenly worse this afternoon and died as nearly as might be the same minute she opened her eyes. That much for the doctors, say I. 
the party they say is dead is alive and kicking, and the party they say will recover goes and dies in spite of them. Blessed if I don't go through the hospitals and get up for a hem D myself. I couldn't do worse than that. The carpenter stopped on seeing his master turn ghastly pale and begin to tremble all over as if he had seen a ghost. Bob, said the undertaker tremulously, you told me the man's illness started with a fit and a fall and he hurt himself when he fell down. Cut an awful gash across his forehead, they tell me, from there to there, replied the carpenter, indicating with his finger an imaginary wound on his head. The undertaker gasped convulsively and looked so strange that the carpenter thought he must be losing his reason. You didn't make the mistake over the measurement by chance, Bob, he said in a series of queer jerks. It was meant to be, and he fits it as if it was made on purpose. My God, who would have thought it possible? There was a silence in the shop for a minute, and then the undertaker, as if to himself, added, He shall have the broken heart, poor chap. I hope you enjoyed this obscure Victorian ghost story. If you did, please remember to hit the like button. And thank you for listening. <laughs>